Et donc, c'est une de Frank Ross. Starting off the news this week, a paper published in the journal Nature has detailed observations of a supermassive Neptune-sized planet around 545 light years away from our system. TOI 1853b orbits the K2 dwarf star TOI 1853 and, as far as we know, is the star's only planet. It's a fascinating discovery as its mass is nearly 75 times the mass of our own planet and nearly twice as much as any other Neptune-sized planet yet discovered. It's such an unusual discovery that, as the paper says, it presents quite the puzzle for the more conventional and widely accepted theories of planetary formation and planetary evolution. It has been suggested that the planets could have formed through the collision of several protoplanets, but a drastic change in orbit has also been proposed. It would usually be expected that this incredibly massive planet, which has an overall density higher than steel, to be much larger and have formed into a gas giant earlier in its life. It's incredibly difficult to tell a large amount from planets at such a distance, not least about its history. It could have a complicated and violent history or could be a key to help us to understand planetary formation and evolution in a completely different way. At the very least, it can certainly be said that this planet is an enormously important addition to our array of discovered exoplanets, all helping both fit out the universe and our understanding of it. And in other news, a paper has been published in the journal Annals of Neurology that announces the discovery of a new cause of Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia. By analysing targeted post-mortem human brain tissue, the team behind this paper found that ferroptosis appears to be a major mechanism of white matter injury in Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia. Ferroptosis is a type of cell death that is caused by a buildup of iron in a cell, triggered by excessive lipid peroxidation. The researchers found that myelin decay triggered by ferroptosis, myelin being a protective sheath around brain nerve fibres, triggered a response from microglia cells, which usually would clear the dead myelin. But by interacting in this way with iron-rich myelin, the microglia are destroyed themselves. Microglia haven't always been a focus of study in this area. However, after the discovery of their degeneration, the researchers began to focus on why this might be happening, then making this discovery. This is a very important discovery in the fight to help us tackle such brain-related diseases, and we very much hope to see big developments to come. Next up, in June, the Icelandic Minister for Food, Agriculture and Fisheries put in place a temporary ban on hunting for fin whales. A report published in May had highlighted that the whales were taking, on average, 11 and a half minutes to die an excruciating death. Some were taking more than an hour and had been harpooned multiple times. The ban was put in place until the 31st of August and so has now been lifted, which has caused an outcry from many conservation organisations. However, stringent new regulations have been put in place and it was hoped that this would deter any whaling before the end of the season, which is in mid-September. However, boats were ready to go whaling and on Monday, in a bid to stop them, two activists climbed to the masts of two different boats. One of the protesters managed to remain chained to the mast for 27 hours, the other protester for 33 hours, in spite of authorities having taken their food and water. There is concern that the boats will return to whaling on Wednesday or Thursday and a police presence remains near the boats to prevent any other protesters climbing on board. Ultimately, it was hoped that these regulations would be so tough to implement and maintain and that the one remaining whaling company would give up whaling altogether or that a new license which could be issued at the end of the year will not be granted. Unfortunately, at the moment, that hope is looking very bleak. And finally from me this week, Scientists have successfully grown a 14-day-old human embryo model without using any sperm or egg cells. The findings, detailed in a study published in the journal Nature, describe how it was recently observed that mouse embryonic cells are capable of self-assembling, and so these findings were tested on human cells. 
Using modified stem cells, the research team grew what has now been described as a complete embryo model, even releasing hormones that turned a pregnancy test positive. The reason this research may be so important is that these scientists are trying to create what they believe to be an ethical solution to the lack of research into very early embryo development. For most of the world, the cutoff point for embryo research is 14 days, but legally an embryo model like this one rather than an embryo that has been grown from a fertilised egg cell has a different classification. As this research becomes more common, further ethical questions surrounding embryo models in research will surely surface. And now over to Ben, with some news about some of us. Thanks Doug. First up in the paleontology news for this week is an interesting new paper describing a new species of Triassic marine reptile and its implications for the evolution of long necks. The new species has been named Chusaurus jangensis, I apologise for the pronunciation there, and it comes from an early Triassic aged formation in South China. The fossils that the new species is based on are pretty spectacular, with the type specimen being fully articulated and with almost all bones preserved, except a few from the skull and neck. Chusaurus is a type of reptile called a Pachypleurosaurid, a branch of the Sauropterygians, meaning they're related to the famous plesiosaurs and pliosaurs. Well, Chusaurus is quite interesting in that it possesses a relatively short neck, whereas later Pachypleurosaurids had proportionally very long necks comprising many more individual vertebrae, reminiscent of the plesiosaurs themselves. Some of these longer-necked Pachypleurosaurids lived only 5 million years after Chusaurus, indicating that the evolution of longer necks by adding more vertebrae occurred fairly rapidly in geological terms, before then slowing down again. Comparing this rate of neck elongation evolution to other groups of Sauropterygians, they found that long necks evolved relatively rapidly in all lineages of Sauropterygians, likely as the result of the re-establishment of various marine ecosystems, providing the opportunity for new feeding styles in the wake of the end Permian mass extinction. Also in the news is a new study that has found evidence for a massive population crash of human ancestors about 930,000 years ago, with only around 1300 individual humans surviving and breeding to eventually give rise to us today. Quite a terrifying prospect. By using the genomes of over 3,000 individual modern humans and a new kind of analysis method called FitCol, the researchers detected a severe bottleneck in the ancestral population of all modern humans between 930,000 and 813,000 years ago, and for these 117,000 years, the population stayed very low. The start of the bottleneck apparently saw the reduction of our ancestors' population from over 98,000 individuals to fewer than 1,280 breeding individuals, and then eventually there was a rapid recovery and the population reached over 27,000 again. This is obviously a very significant discovery with many implications for the evolution of our species, and based on these results it seems that humans very nearly went extinct at this time. The reduction is suggested by the researchers to potentially explain the scarcity of hominin fossils in Africa and Eurasia between 950 and 650,000 years ago. And although there is still much discussion about which species of Homo represents the direct Homo sapiens ancestor, this study favours Homo hadelbergensis as the ancestral species, which likely appeared in Africa by about 800,000 years ago. So this might be the species that faced the severe bottleneck, or at least included the certain population of hadelbergensis that may have eventually given rise to Homo sapiens and therefore experienced this bottleneck. Then there's also the question of the timing of the Neanderthal and Denisovan split from their common ancestor with Homo sapiens, which some studies have timed to between 500 and 700,000 years ago, placing it potentially around the bottleneck. Additionally, it might also be that the fusion of two of our chromosomes occurred around the time of this bottleneck too, giving us a total of 46 instead of the 48 that modern chimps, gorillas and older species of Homo had. So, did this restriction in population size have something to do with the splitting of our species and other hominins? Other paleoanthropologists have advised that the proposed bottleneck needs further testing and correlating with the human fossil record, and it might be that the bottleneck itself was a very localised event, potentially only affecting our direct ancestors, since other species of Homo were of course also alive at this time, such as Homo erectus, Homo antecessor, and others. The actual cause of the bottleneck is suspected to be due to severe climatic change as Africa became much colder and drier around this time, but the fact that our ancestors managed to survive at such an apparently small population size for so long and then make a recovery seems quite extraordinary, and again the results have been questioned by other researchers. 
Nevertheless, it's a very intriguing study that opens up a whole series of new questions that will undoubtedly be investigated further in the future, and I'm looking forward to seeing how this all develops. And finally for the news this week, a new species of probable prehistoric koala has been described. Named Luma koala blackae, the material it's based on comprises three molars that display a characteristic cusp and valley anatomy, enabling probable placement within the koala family, Phascolarctidae. Dating to the late Oligocene epoch, over 23 million years ago, Luma koala, along with a couple of other already named species, represent the oldest koalas so far known to us. Based on the size of the teeth, Luma koala was likely a very small animal, with body mass estimates ranging from 2.2 to 2.6 kilograms. And the specific anatomy of the teeth allows for comparisons with other marsupials that helps to better refine our understanding of how these mammals evolved. That's it from me for this week, back to Dog in the Studio. Thank you, Ben. Well, that's it for this week's 7 Days of Science. I do hope you enjoyed, and as always, we'll see you on Sunday.